order. This is uh, meeting number 68 of the Standing Committee on Health in the 42nd Parliament. Uh, from Cannabis Culture, we have Jody Emery and Mark Emery. Welcome. Uh, now we go to Cannabis Culture for 10 minutes. I believe, um, Mark Emery, you're going to open with, for five minutes and then share. Five okay. I look forward to the five, Mr. Yep. Chair. Yep. And thank you for inviting us. We are from Cannabis Culture, which is an activist organization since 1994 that's been dedicated to uh, overgrowing this government, which in our language is to legalize this government. I said overgrow, not the throw. And it's important, and all due respect that this is the health committee, but you know, marijuana is one of the safest substances on earth. And I walk down Spark Street and it's safer than every product they're selling there. It's safer than candy, it's safer than eating at McDonald's, it's safer than prescription drugs, tobacco, alcohol, all of which is commonly available on this street. It's safer than cheerleading in high school, it's safer than football in high school, it's safer than hockey in high school. You could rarely make a more safe choice than choosing to use cannabis for whatever reason. And that's why I think it's wholly unworthy of a parliament to spend a whole week discussing the health concerns of a substance that has not killed anybody while being supplied by the free market, some call it the black market, for the last 50 years. Imagine, can you conceptualize any other product that hasn't killed anyone in 50 years? Cars kill people all the time, alcohol, tobacco, prescription drugs, foods kill people, obesity kills people. Everything you do in the society out there, exercising your own bodily autonomy guaranteed to us by the Supreme Court in the Morgan Dollar case to control our own bodies, there are few things you could take uh, that are not more harmful than cannabis. In fact, even government-approved water in Walkerton, Ontario has killed eight people. So water is more dangerous than marijuana, realistically. This should be at the Justice Committee. And the reason is, I've been in 36 prisons and jails for pot. I was exiled by my own government for five years to the United States for selling seeds by mail. Can you imagine this country was founded on agriculture and farming, and yet I spent five years in jail? co-authorized by my own government because I sent seeds to willing adults to plant plants. We've come to this. The Justice Committee should be looking at this because 2,400,000 Canadians have been criminalized with charges of cannabis offenses since 1965. There is nothing else in this country remotely close to 2.4 million people getting charged for doing something they love, which is growing or selling or consuming marijuana, and harming no one else. If we've got organized crime in there, it's because you created it. Had you not criminalized marijuana, nobody would be handling marijuana except organized regular retailers in our usual business regime. So you're the problem. You're at fault. I, we've had prohibition for 93 years. I've never seen Parliament modernize it or ameliorate that terrible things in any of that time. I spent three months in Saskatoon Correctional for passing one joint. I was sent to the United States for five years for sending seeds to Americans. I'm not, and we have done every manner of disobedience. Like I say, I've been arrested probably at least 27 or eight times, and I've been jailed 36 times. I've been jailed in nine out of 10 provinces for my act. Activism. I've seen prisons in this town, in this country, and we need to get rid of this criminalization and the legalization that everybody really wanted when we thought we were electing Mr. Trudeau and his platform was simply the way it was brought in. In 1923, the health minister got up, sorry, the justice minister got up in the parliament and said, Mr. Speaker, we've added a new drug to the schedule, and that was it. No other discussion, nothing else. So you can legalize it in the exact same way. Mr. Speaker, we've removed cannabis from the schedule. That's the only legalization that's really permissible. It's the only one that's really legalization. Everything else is a recriminalization. In fact, I dare say there are more criminal offenses in the new Cannabis Act than there currently are in the existing legislation. So you're actually broadening it to include more people with more offenses, and virtually everybody who needs to be legalized, all the growers in this country, all the sellers and all the consumers, they will still be criminalized under this Cannabis Act. Only licensed producers, a very small minority, are going to be allowed to grow marijuana. You can't possess, possess marijuana that doesn't even come from a licensed producer or some Ontario government monopoly or Quebec government monopoly or New Brunswick government monopoly as they're going. So now, before at least we were only criminalized, now we're going to be criminalized and exploited by our own governments. We're going to be used as a cash cow, having our own culture usurped from us and handed over to a bunch of bureaucrats and politicians who probably never smoked pot in their life, don't understand anything about these people, don't understand anything about us, and it's a total insult to about 5 million Canadians who adore this plant, love this 
this plant, use this plant, consume it, sell it, grow it, and have been involved their whole lives like I have in this plant. And to listen to this kind of discussion, the government that's oppressed us is going to come and be our liberators and hand us and dole us out like we're children. Children. We're being condescended to in the worst possible way. We're adults. We make choices. If you're concerned about children, great. Deal with that. But for most of the country who smokes marijuana, they're 18 years to 80 years old. Thank you, Mr. Casey. That's five minutes. I'll let my wife continue. She's going to tell you how great marijuana is. <laughs> I'd like to thank you for inviting me to speak here, and I represent, I believe, the victims of prohibition while I'm here. We've heard from a lot of experts and bureaucrats, and a lot of people who have a lot to say, and it's fantastic that we're having this discussion. The idea that we're sitting here today talking about legalization in this country, it means a lot to me personally. I campaigned for the Liberals as a nomination candidate because I believed in legalization. Because not only am I currently a victim of prohibition myself, out on bail before you here after being arrested six months ago but prior to that I was a drug war widow I spent years with my husband taken away from me and imprisoned in a foreign country he had never been to with the Drug Enforcement Administration saying very clearly it was because of his legalization activism and because he gave millions of dollars to legalization reform groups around the world that's the DEA's own chief Karen Tandy and it's a press release you can easily see so he says it was for seeds but the US government says it was for legal legalization activism. We're here to talk about legalizing cannabis, which means we should not have any law enforcement concerns. If it's going to be legal, law enforcement should be able to focus on actual crimes with real victims like rape, assault, murder, theft. I have law enforcement family members. My aunt and uncle are in Alberta with the RCMP and work with MAD. My sister is also with the Vancouver Police Department. I care about law enforcement. I care about the laws. I care about this country and our citizens. But our country and these laws and our citizens are harmed by this prohibition and by any criminalization of cannabis. Even if cannabis was dangerous, even if it killed people every day and contributed to rape and assault and murder of our young adults all across this country like alcohol does, it shouldn't be illegal. We should have the free choice to consume or grow or share a plant that isn't just benign or neutral. As you've heard, it actually helps people. It actually saves lives. And I know we only have a few minutes here, but I want to try and cite, if you'll read my brief, I submitted 10 pages, reduced to five. But let's look at the actual health impact of cannabis. The American Journal of Medicine in 2013 and the Journal of Health Economics in 2017 said cannabis use reduces obesity. It results in healthier, thinner consumers. The Journal of American Medical Association in 2015 said cannabis is medicine. The Journal of the American Medical Association in 2012 said a 20-year study found no damage to lungs from cannabis. This is backed up by Dr. Donald Tashkin, whom the U.S. government asked to prove it causes lung cancer. They found it actually prevents it. You can go to cancer.gov. The U.S. government says that cannabis and cannabinoids attack and kill cancer cells. They shrink brain cancer cells. That's the Journal of Molecular Cancer Therapies of 2014. You've got the American Journal of Public Health in 2014 saying that cannabis access reduces suicide rates. My father took his life when I was nine. This gold necklace here was his. I was on antidepressants for many years and they caused me harm. And we heard just yesterday that antidepressants increase suicide rates by 33 percent. That's why I got off of antidepressants and I used cannabis instead. I use legal cannabis because I'm out on bail, so I'm not allowed to go to a dispensary. But I'm going to just show you here. This is a marijuana joint. This is what we're here to talk about. This is cannabis, and it's not hurting anybody. But I've been inside the U.S. prison system, and I'll tell you, I didn't cry for myself or my husband as victims of prohibition. I cried for the children and the mothers and the families who were there visiting their loved ones, the little babies who saw their daddy on the other side of the visiting room. And they said, why is my daddy here? He didn't hurt anybody. They say prisoners are bad, but my dad, he's not bad, is he? And the moms are trying not to cry, and these little kids are saying, Mom, please don't cry, please please be brave. These are the victims of cannabis prohibition. Cannabis prohibition has far more victims and far more devastation than cannabis ever could. And right now we do have a drug crisis in this country. It's the opioid crisis. None of you here have not heard of it. And you have the United States National Institute on Drug Abuse 
saying that cannabis dispensaries reduce opioid deaths. You've got so much evidence showing that even the Harvard study of Frontiers in Pharmacology says it improves cognitive functioning. The American Psychological Association in 2015 said teens, even chronic users, do not have later issues. The British Journal, uh, they find cannabis is the safest substance. So I get emotional here because I followed the law. Every year my husband was incarcerated, I had to cross that U.S. border, knowing they could ask me if I used pot and I could be denied the ability to see my husband. And I managed to get through because I followed the rules as closely as I could. And then we decided to engage in peaceful civil disobedience, just like Dr. Henry Morgenthaler, who received the Order of Canada for breaking the law to provide a much needed service. Civil disobedience is the only way we've managed to change these laws in this country with respect to cannabis. I look, I really appreciate your passion and your commitment to this, and you're going to have lots of chance to uh, answer questions and provide. You won't see an increase in impaired driving it's because just of cannabis. Not, well, time's up, but Ms. Emery, you, you wanted to make a comment. I understand driving and cannabis is a major issue and a concern, and I am not advocating impaired driving, but the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration of the United States released a report in 2015 that called drug and alcohol crash risk and found, did not find an increase increase in crash risk associated with THC. And even more recently, the American Journal of Public Health, as we are here at the Health Committee, in 2017, July, very recent, please look this up, that changes in motor vehicle crash fatality rates for Washington and Colorado were not statistically different from those in similar states without recreational marijuana legalization. And we do know that police, this is recent studies, so please do look this up. And I'm not encouraging impaired driving, but the vast majority of cannabis consumers are not driving impaired. Their judgment is not impaired like with alcohol. With alcohol, you think you can drive and you know you can't. With cannabis, you know when you can't and you won't drive. But we also have to consider the hundreds of thousands of medical marijuana patients in this country who are unable to drive or contribute or work if they don't use cannabis. So if you criminalize those who drive under the influence of cannabis, you're going to criminalize every patient and poor medical user across this country. What we're also finding is that this targeted harassment, as we've admitted, would require taking someone to a hospital, using a needle, drawing their blood against their will when they don't get to give consent and for what to prove that they've consumed cannabis or to prove that they're impaired because impairment is proven by performance whether you're driving behind the wheel on pharmaceutical drugs that say do not operate heavy machinery or your vehicles while using these pills whether you're angry because you had a fight or whether you're texting texting is proven to increase crashes we know it it happened immediately you can immediately say Cell phones and texting create distracted driving, create increased crashes on the road. It's demonstrable, it's proven. Cannabis, you can't prove it. And that's why the police and law enforcement are falling all over trying to figure out how do we find a test? How do we set a blood limit? And as an official endorser of Washington State's Initiative 502 campaign, I was part of the legalization along with my husband's prosecutor, so you can find common ground with people who worked against you before. But they admitted that they only had a blood level for cannabis because doing so would encourage the public to support that initiative. What we have to acknowledge is that decades of prohibition and misinformation generated by the government and fear about driving cannabis is actually discouraging people from finding out the truth about cannabis. And as I said, American Journal of Public Health 2017 studied this extensively. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, cannabis is not a crisis for the roads. Police should be focusing on alcohol and truly dangerous drugs. Thank, Thank you, you very much. For that. And to the Emerys, if C-45 is passed in its current form, will you abide by this new law or continue in civil disobedience? I'm choosing to follow the law as much as I can because I only engaged in opening up dispensaries last year in April, and that's what I'm currently charged with. I do face potentially life in prison as I sit here before you, which would certainly cost the taxpayers a lot more. I do want to add that with municipalities, uh, we should be looking at allowing the storefronts to operate similar to caffeine, which is an addictive stimulant drug that I can get for free right in the back of the room, or like alcohol. If I want to open a bar or a restaurant and provide alcohol or a craft brewery, the municipal regulations and licensing shouldn't be that restrictive or prohibitive or even costly uh, if done right. Good. Mr. Davies. Thank you to all the witnesses for being here. Mm -hmm. I want to just start by saying 
you know, since the Ladane Commission in the early 70s, uh, the issue of legalization of cannabis has been on the public policy agenda for, for decades. And uh, I, I have no illusions that we wouldn't be sitting here today talking about a, a form of, uh, I'm going to call it decriminalization, not legalization, um, of cannabis without the work of uh, many people who have sacrificed a lot. And I think you, Mr. Emery, and you, Ms. Emery, um, I can't think of any two people who are more important to hear from uh, on this legislation than from you. I know you've dedicated your lives to uh, to this subject and, and at great personal cost and sacrifice. So I want to just make that comment. Um, Ms. Emery, I want to start with you about just the broad scheme of the bill. Um, you have described this bill as this is not legalization, it's Prohibition 2.0. Can you please explain that? Well, there are three reasons why Canadians came around to support legalization. Number one is that we shouldn't criminalize our fellow Canadians who are otherwise law-abiding. They should not be banned from traveling to the United States or lose their job for failing a drug test or have their kids taken away by children's aid. None of that criminalization or harm should happen to peaceful, nonviolent Canadians. Number two, this industry already exists. It's worth billions of dollars. The Fraser Institute and many others have analyzed it and said cannabis should be legal because it already exists. It's already being grown and sold and shared and Consumed. It's in every movie and TV show. It's everywhere. It's normalized, except for with the government. So we should allow the existing industry to come out of the shadows and into the light. The third reason to legalize is that law enforcement has spent billions of dollars, billions of our tax dollars, on going after people for pot. I'd much prefer that go towards health care or education or social housing or anything, or allowing our law enforcement to focus on serious crimes that have victims. But Bill C-45, as it's presented, will not offer amnesty or pardon to people who have been convicted. It will not allow people like my husband and myself to be free from a criminal record. It will not allow the existing industry to transition into legality. In fact, it introduces tougher new penalties and prohibits those who have been victimized by prohibition from being allowed to transition. So we're being locked out from participating and locked up for being unable to participate. The third reason for marijuana legalization being law enforcement spending, well, Friday we saw an announcement of a quarter billion dollars of additional tax dollars going towards marijuana law enforcement. Well, legalization is supposed to mean you no longer have to enforce a law against it. We know that marijuana law enforcement is extremely costly, and many police officers don't even want to enforce the law, which is why they often don't charge some people, but do charge others. And as Mr. Bill Blair, who is not with us right now, has admitted himself, marijuana prohibition and law enforcement targets people who are of color, indigenous groups, more, the poor, the marginalized. So this bill will not legalize anything that we've been fighting for it. Other witnesses have pointed out that the, the bill still contains a criminalized model where if you have more than 30 grams uh, of possession in public place, you can be subject to criminal sanction. Mm -hmm. If you have more than four plants over 100 centimeters, you can be arrested and, and, uh, and serve time mm -hmm. selling and, and uh, uh, other kinds of offenses. Um, Mr. Emery, Justin Trudeau, our Prime Minister, is quoted as saying on getting it right. He said, quote, we have to create an entire system that controls and regulates marijuana that will include medical marijuana and properly licensed dispensaries. Um, are we getting it right? Oh, goodness, no. Uh, it's all wrong. And in fact, it, to answer your colleague's question, will I continue to break the law? Absolutely. Because the law, breaking the law is the only way the cannabis culture has gotten any kind of improvement in their status over the last 20 years. For example, this parliament banned all books and magazines about marijuana in 1987. That law lasted seven years until I and some colleagues started distributing books and magazines in front of police stations. And we finally got charged giving out pamphlets to high school students. And we went to Judge J. Ellen MacDonald in the Ontario Superior Court, and she struck that down. So then I started, you know, distributing pamphlets and encouraging everybody to sell bongs and pipes, which were all illegal. And now we have a thriving industry across Canada. And I started selling seeds, which were illegal and probably still are illegal. And I sold millions of them to Americans and Canadians so we could bypass this government because the only way to really make pot legal, I thought, was if marijuana was everywhere and everybody had it, then the government would be helpless, which is really why we're here, because we won. We've accomplished that. Marijuana's everywhere. People are growing it. There's stores opening. We don't care 
if we go to jail. We don't care if you charge us. We're going to do our thing because we love cannabis and we're in the cannabis culture. So I'm going to continue to break these laws because it's terrible. It criminalizes everybody who is supposed to be legalized and then enriches the government monopolies that are what are being proposed and these wealthy stock market production companies who don't have any relationship to cannabis but just raise money on the stock market, somehow get hand in glove with the liberal government, and now they're operating and selling marijuana even though people I know have been doing it 10, 20, 30 years are not going to be offered any such invitation. I just want, because I'm really curious about your opinion on this. We've already heard Ontario, I think you mentioned Quebec and maybe possibly New Brunswick, yes. are moving to a government monopoly system yes. that will clearly freeze out dispensaries. Um, I'm just wondering what you think about that. I mean, will, will it... Well, they can't be. They, that won't be supportable. I will encourage everybody to boycott the government stores. We will physically try and stop people from going in. We're going to advise them that they're traitors if they go to the government shops. Because these are the people that have oppressed us for 50 years. You're going to give your money to the very enemy that's beaten us, killed our animals when they raid us, rounded up our kids, took away our cash, took away our plants, took away our livelihoods. Are you kidding me? We can never let the government be the profiteers of marijuana after all the years that they They've abused us, exploited us, and persecuted us. It's pure sadism. This cannabis law is pure sadism. The one you're proposing and the one that we've had for 50 years, it's just punishing Canadians for no valid reason. I move to production because the, the task force uh, said that decisions on production, distribution, and retail have clear implications for businesses hoping to enter the cannabis industry, including how to ensure a diversity of participants. It is apparent that there is significant interest and speculation about the potential for new revenues. Supply chain management has significant implications for consumers and communities. Price, uh, product quality, and accessibility can all be affected depending on what route the government chooses to take. So they recommended use licensing and production controls to encourage a diverse com competitive market that also includes small producers. Do you see C45 accomplishing that recommendation? Bill C45 accomplishes no objective whatsoever that is desirable. And the thing is, it's staring us all in the face. If we want the price to plummet where money's not even a factor with marijuana, if we want all Canadians to be treated fairly before the law, if we want to restore civil liberties, if we want to take away all that police power we've given the police for 30, 40 years to wiretap, to surveil, to pose as drug dealers, to do all this sort of stuff that's costing billions of dollars, then just take cannabis out of the schedule. Just remove it from the schedule, tell everybody that otherwise you have to be law-abiding, peaceful, pay your taxes, pay your employees well, you know, obey all municipal regulations, but basically just treat it like any other normal industry. After all, it hasn't killed anybody for 50 years. There isn't any other industry in this country that's like that. They all put out pollution that kills, or the cars that kill, or the foods that kill, or their drugs that kill, or their tobaccos that kill, or alcohol that kills. Heck, everything is killing Canadians except cannabis, and you want to treat it like it's plutonium. It's insane. I'd like to add that with uh, one of the major issues of C45 is that the federal government does control the production. Now, you've all heard of BC Bud. Cannabis has been growing all across this country for a very long time. And the provinces deserve and should have the power and the ability to license their own production agents themselves. If the provinces have to wait on the federal government to supply cannabis, the provincial government stores are going to not have any product on the shelf. We saw Nevada declare a state of emergency asking for more pot growth to come forward because they sold out in one week and we're seeing it happen all over the world so you need a lot of supply you need it everywhere you need to allow municipalities to license their own craft growers and like craft breweries you need to allow provinces to do it and you need to allow the federal government to let it happen but if the production is controlled federally distribution provincially storefronts and policing municipally of course you've got a big disaster coming but only government could think of that plan <laughs> only government the marketplace would look at that and go in horror that will never work. Also, I'd like to add that if you do allow the provinces the control over setting up pot monopolies, we could call it, instead of allowing Canadian citizens, innovators, entrepreneurs, small business owners, instead of allowing them to create jobs, create tax revenue, and give back to the community, you're going to force every taxpayer to subsidize a multi-hundred million dollar government bureaucracy that the government itself admits they will not be able to make money from, they're going to lose money, and again, they don't even know what the product is. Why can they not allow the people who have grown and sold and love this plant, why can't they allow us to come forward and come out of the shadows? Why do you continue to criminalize us? What do you have against us for 50 years of the to briefing? Move to Mr. McKinnon now. Thanks very much. I have a good solution. Um, 
Our Canadian farmers currently grow cannabis on thousands and thousands of acres in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Alberta. And it's just, they use it for seeds, but it's the same plant. It's marijuana. They can grow this marijuana. They can grow marijuana that would sell in our stores or any stores for $20,000 a metric ton. That's two cents a gram. So it could be sold for a dollar or two dollars a gram, but a tremendous profit to all our farmers across the prairies who have enormous amounts of land that can be used to grow marijuana. At that point, no one would grow it in their home. Growing in your home is expensive. It requires electricity. Um, it's an unnecessary use of urban space. Essentially, if you just legalize marijuana the way you're supposed to, let anybody grow it who's in a position to grow it on an economy of scale, the price will plummet. No one will grow in their home anymore. None of us would. I'm looking for the day when legalization takes all the money out of marijuana. Uh, thank that, you, that's thank so you. common. Thank you. I, have to, um, I had some questions in regards to the border issue and trade. Um, we have we're undergoing like negotiations with our biggest trading partner, the, the Americans with NAFTA. But there's a concern that I've heard being out of sync with our greatest trading partners. And I was wondering if you thought that it should be made a priority that we should be explaining what we're doing in this regard, because um, if right now the Americans, if they just ask you, they can stop you from going into the U.S. and um, this trading issue is all about jobs and the economy. I was wondering if that affects the municipalities and then maybe also Mr. Emery that I think you're quite aware they're very high profile Canadians who have admitted to smoking marijuana have no problem going back and forth to the U.S. but uh, like how does that make you feel? Well that's unusual. Most people if they uh, uh a border official does a Google search and finds that you've got any relationship with marijuana, they're likely to bar you from entering, at least at that time, and up to 30 days, and possibly permanently. There are lots of examples of Canadians now permanently barred who were, in fact, the former mayor of Grand Forks, Brian Taylor, found himself uh, barred from going back there. He used to go over there to buy milk and eggs, amazingly. I don't know why that's reasonable, but it's so close to the Grand Forks that he used to go and buy his, now he's barred from doing so because he's had a relationship with marijuana, he's advocated as mayor. I will tell you this though, the border states of Washington, of Vermont, uh, Maine, New York, uh, Wisconsin, and Minnesota all have medical marijuana or legalization regimes. So the entire border, with the exception of Idaho and Montana and Pennsylvania, which is not so much on a border but across the lake, they're the only three states left that don't have some kind of medical or legal regime going on in the United States. So this argument that we're going to have a trade problem is diminished. What we're going to have is a border problem. One of the things they haven't thought of with the Ontario monopoly is that every single employee who works for the Ontario Cannabis Control Board is going to be barred from entering the United States. So as long as part of their employment they're willing to admit they're never going to the United States again, then that's fine. I'm sure they'll get employees. We in the free market already acknowledge this, that we're not going to be able to travel to the United States if we have a relationship with cannabis that's in any way public. So I suspect every Every government employee who wants to work for a marijuana shop might want to consider if they have family in the United States or if they ever go to the United States because they're going to be barred. Mayor Holmes, do you have? Uh, do you think this should be a priority issue discussed maybe between our Prime Minister and the American President about how this will affect our border? Because I guess my last question, uh, or so the question I would ask, or more of a comment and reaction, a comment for the, for the Emrys and for others that have been part of this very strong. Uh, culture and trying to create change. The purpose of the act um, is to prevent young persons from accessing cannabis, to protect public health and public safety by establishing stricter product safety and product quality requirements, and to deter criminal activity by imposing serious criminal, criminal penalties. The goal of the act, so if you read that, it isn't about recreational marijuana users and optimizing their experience and optimizing their choices, it's a very different lens. And, and I think that's the social difference or maybe the, the philosophical difference. Um, so I, I just, I, I understand and hear your frustration, I hear the background that you're coming from, but the Act addresses different social agendas than the one you've been speaking to. Well, then it's inadequate, it's simply, but, but here's the thing, what's more, also important is there's no apology. The government has to admit that this policy has been wrong for 50 years, that demonizing, persecuting, arresting and charging 2.4 million Canadians was wrong-headed. It was counterproductive, didn't do anything good for anybody except the police, 
who benefit by all these things. One thing I would like to point out, you're only a youth at age 15, 16, 17 for three years, and then for another 70 years on, on average, you're an adult. From age 18 to 85, which is the average length of life in this country now, you're an adult. So you shouldn't be writing laws for the three years prior to becoming an adult for 70 years. You should be writing the law for the adults. Autonomous adults who can get themselves abortions, who can fill themselves with alcohol. I can buy all the alcohol I want, fill my house. I can do a lot of things that are very, very dangerous. And this government and this society, a free democratic society, allows me to do that. And that's great because most people handle responsibility well when given to them. But in this act, it's the opposite. It's like we're children, we're being condescended to constantly, told absurd, ridiculous things like your plant can't be higher than this. Who can control nature like that? These are plants, they grow. Right? They're going to be all sorts of sizes and stuff like that. Thank you. Thank Everything you. in the legislation I, I to, is inadequate. I hear your reaction, but I just wanted to make sure that we clearly understood the intent. Uh, oh, you said you were going to legalize. Yeah. You didn't say this was a halfway measure to get somewhere. I this I was promised as a legalization by the prime minister at the last election. Um, mm -hmm. Ms. Emery, um, I want to address this question to you as someone who's operated a dispensary. Prime Minister Trudeau also said this. The challenge of getting this important initiative right is one of ensuring we are broadly listening to partners, to folks in the medical marijuana industry, to municipal partners, to provinces, and drawing from best practices from around the world. We're going to get this right in a way that suits Canadians broadly. Now, I, I want to ask you a question about edibles and um, uh, concentrates and other products that C45 will continue to make illegal. Um, we've heard evidence uh, before this committee from co that Colorado, Washington, Alaska have all legalized edibles. Colorado appears to have a, a very mature and thoughtful uh, regulatory regime about those products. And here's what the task force said about edibles. In weighing the arguments for and against limitations on edibles, the majority of the task force concluded that allowing these products offers an opportunity to better address other health risks. Edible cannabis products offer the possibility of shifting consumers away from smoked cannabis and any associated lung-related harms. This is a benefit not just to the user, but to those around them. This position, uh, oh, I'm sorry, um, uh, they said that access to broad range of cannabis products is possible via the illicit market, including through dispensaries and online retailers. So they recommend that they, the government regulate the production of cannabis and its derivatives for example, edibles concentrates at the federal level, drawing on the good production practices of the current cannabis for medical purposes system, end quote. Do you see um, the omission of edibles um, in this bill and concentrates as, as a good or bad thing? I think Canadians should have the free choice to consume cannabis however they would like, and I know that the Supreme Court of Canada sided with edible producers who literally made cookies and sold them in a dispensary. That's R.V. Smith, determining that cannabis patients do need access to oils, tinctures, extracts, hashish, whatever it may be. Edibles are extremely valuable, and we know that in Toronto, when the police cracked down last year, they really targeted edibles, and seniors are the ones who are hurt most elderly people, grandparents who come in and they're tired of these pills that they're on, they're tired of being unable to sleep and all they know is that a couple bites of a cookie at night after dinner helps them feel better. No law should prohibit someone from having access to that. And if you'd like to see what branding and advertising and edibles look like, go to a cannabis event. Just follow my social media if you like, or check online, and you'll find that there are these marijuana events everywhere. There was an event called the Karma Cup that just happened. And you can see there are dozens and dozens of brands that are sophisticated. They've got logos. They've got products. They put a lot of time and effort into this because the producers of edibles in this country are not shady dealers on the street corner trying to get kids to use pot. They're conscientious Canadian citizens who are trying to provide a much needed service. Edibles have to be legal. I personally don't believe the federal government should be managing all these little details. I think cannabis should be removed from the CDSA and let everybody figure it out as they may. But edibles must be legal. They must be allowed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Emery, um, the task force also said this about e-commerce mail order. 
Consideration be should be given to ensuring that online retail sales have appropriate consumer safeguards to accommodate those who may not have access to storefronts, for example, small communities, rural and remote locations, mobility challenged individuals, a direct-to-consumer mail order system for non-medical cannabis should be considered. You're probably aware that C45 does not contain a permanent national e-commerce platform. Is that a, a, a positive or negative thing in your opinion? Well, a lot of these things depend on your interpretation. As representing the free market slash black market, I would say that's more business for us if the government wants to neglect that area. But the, what we're really looking for in legalization is a reduction in the price over time, because something that's legal should be cheap. And right now, uh, the price of marijuana is artificially high, and all the derivatives are way too high. People are spending far too much money on marijuana, and that's created a lot of the problems, is that it's attracted gangs, it's attracted criminals, it's attracting government. All I've heard from these fellows from the municipalities, how can we gouge the public for more money? We need more money. And somehow legalization is going to cost every single bureaucracy more than it did before. The cities are going to spend millions. The cops are going to spend millions more. You'd think we were doubling up on the criminalization, which we may well be doing, and that's why we have to spend all this money. Because it doesn't sound like legalization from anything I've heard from a municipality, from a provincial government, or from anybody here. It sounds like you're all into control and gouging as much money out of a vulnerable population of pot smokers as you can possibly get. And that, to me, is the real reason for this legislation. It's not to legalize pot. It was legalized pot. Mr. Trudeau would say, Mr. Speaker, we have a majority. We've just removed cannabis from the schedule. My health minister will direct that. And from now on, the provinces are free to regulate. And that would be the whole legal campaign. Instead, you've got 300 pages of a Cannabis Act that recriminalizes everybody, makes a huge bureaucracy of government at all levels, which we don't need, spends a lot more money, gives police more power. That sounds like prohibition. Thanks. Mr. Mr. Speaker. Time, time's up. Okay. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to move my motion now, oh, if I may. Um, I, I, as I've given notice yesterday, I would like to move that pursu pursuant to Standing Order 1082. This committee meet for an additional two days for the purpose of the consideration of Bill C-45, an act respecting cannabis, and to amend the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, the Criminal Code, and other acts, and that the chair be empowered to coordinate the witnesses to a minimum of 32 witnesses, eight per, per stakeholder group, the resources and scheduling necessary to complete this task in accordance with the following guidelines. When I, I, let's, let's excuse the witnesses. They've, they've been here a long time. They will continue on with your with your issue, okay? Is that all right with you? I have all the time in the world. Uh, uh, <laughs> Unemployed. Um, but we, we have, we, we invited the well, witnesses to be you, here. You said, Mr. Chair, that I was the last speaker, so whether yeah. they're sitting there or not doesn't seem to really matter. But I just think we happen. should, I think we should thank the witnesses and uh, for their contribution. They've all made a unique contribution, everyone. We value them all. They're very important uh, testimony today. So on behalf of, on, of all the members of the committee, I want to thank you all for your contribution and your, you. and your uh, information. So with that, go ahead. You're, you're, I'll just...